Hello, my name is Kate Drabinski and uh, I work for Ideas on Fire and I'm here with this month's webinar about wellness for academics, scholars, and other cultural workers. And we wanted to do this webinar right now because if you're watching it live, you know that it's the new year and we are all inundated with requests and demands to set resolutions or intentions or to sort of plan this year and how do we change everything. Uh, and I know for myself, uh, New Year, same me, uh, I like me, uh, and yet it is a time to pause and reflect on what we can do to really take care of ourselves. So that's what this webinar is about. So the way it will work is in a second, I will disappear from this live screen and pull up the slides for the PowerPoint. And I'll work through those slides uh, about 30 to 40 minutes, and then I'll come back to this screen. Hello. And if you have things that you want to talk about or ideas, ways that you incorporate wellness into your schedule, go ahead and type it into this column so that we can um, chat about them when we're done. All right, so I'm now going to disappear and I'll see you on the flip side. All right, so today's um, webinar is, as I said, wellness for academics, scholars, and other cultural workers. On tap today, we're going to start by talking about the problem with wellness. When we were coming up with a title for this, it was a bit of a struggle. So we'll talk a bit about that, uh, but then why wellness still matters in spite of our critiques of the concept. And then we'll talk about uh, how to make time and space for wellness activities, especially given the sort of demand that we remain productive at all moments. Uh, and then we'll walk through sort of three areas where wellness uh, can be important, exercise, food, and mindfulness. Uh, and then we'll end today talking about the promise and also the limits of self-care and wellness and show you some other resources at Ideas on Fire uh, to continue this conversation. So that's what's on tap today. All right, so let's um, start by talking about wellness. Uh, what does the word wellness mean to you? Uh, this, I think, is important because it's, um, it means something different to all of us, right? So for me, wellness means uh, taking care of my health, which as a cancer survivor means uh, daily exercise to keep my um, joints going with the medications that I'm on and uh, eating in ways that are nourishing uh, and keeping my stress levels as low as possible. So that's what wellness means to me. Uh, your priorities around wellness, I think, change depending on what else is going on in your life. Maybe uh, during job market season, wellness means getting applications in early. You know, sometimes that's what that's about. Um, so it really depends on what it means for you. I think it's worth um, taking some time to write about this. Think about what areas of your life feel unwell or not, not balanced. Um, and when you're doing that, I think it's important to consider the connections between mind and body. So much of our work is cerebral, and a lot of it is solo, especially for academics. And uh, we can sometimes forget that our body is part of that as well. Even as critical as we are of Cartesian dualism, and as much as we know about embodied knowledges and embodied ways of being, it can be really easy to forget that, especially when the metrics of our productivity uh, often are what matters in um, graduate school or in the academy. Uh, but it's worth at this time of year taking some time to jot down what parts of your life feel unwell so that you can know for yourself what wellness means. Some of the things that I think are really troubling about wellness talk um, is that a lot of wellness talk is about making money for somebody else. We are inundated this time of year with uh, demands that we lose weight, that we get smaller, that we change our diets completely, that we uh, uh, buy and buy and buy things to make ourselves something other than we are. There's this kind of uh, rhetoric in capitalism that we're never good enough. And the way to get good enough is to spend more money. So that's really dangerous. And the wellness industry is definitely one that's growing and it can be extremely expensive. Um, the kind of supplements and, and uh, herbal care and, and different kinds of ways of spending money seem to just explode. 
Another problem with wellness talk, I think, is the body shaming that often accompanies it. Uh, when um, we were talking about doing this webinar, I said I wanted to talk about food, but it's almost impossible to talk about it without diet talk and the diet talk that leads to body shaming and the idea that uh, that your body is wrong the way it is. This is an uh, overwhelming message year round, um, but especially this time of year. Even going to a gym, for example, is you're going to try and uh, my gym, for example, is asking me to pay twenty five dollars to join their quote transformation challenge. And I thought, well, I don't actually need to be transformed. I'm here because it feels good and it's fun. Uh, but the body shaming and wellness talk can be really dangerous. So to even start talking about how to think uh, differently about how you feed yourself uh, can teeter into diet talk territory. And that kind of body shaming adds a another stress to life that's absolutely unnecessary. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I also think that wellness talk can sometimes encourage us to think of new ways that we're not enough, that we're not doing enough to give us more tasks to check off. I was working on my, um, on my uh, yearly journal and I was had all these, I was making lists of things that I might do, like meditate daily and uh, see my acupuncturist once a week, making those lists of things. And I thought, okay, now I've just given myself a bunch of new tasks that I'll probably fail at. So uh, that's also something to keep in mind when we're talking about wellness. It's not about changing your whole life or changing your whole self or body because we're already good enough. It's just, we wanted to take some time to talk about ways to maybe tend to the body uh, in these transitional times. So uh, give it these, these are a lot of um, issues with wellness, but I, I do think that wellness is really important and it still really matters. So first, I think it's important to, as I said before, define wellness for yourself. What sort of counts as being well? So take stock of your mental and physical conditions. What parts feel unwell? So this might include things like um, I'm tired during the day. The, I'm giving you basically my list <laughs> right now. But I'm, I'm tired during the day. Um, I'm, I feel stressed and I'm carrying it in my shoulders. I'm getting headaches, right? Things like that. Just sort of get a sense of what's going on with your physical self, right? Are your bowels moving regularly in ways that feel good? Are you... Um, do you have injuries that are sort of nagging on you? Uh, and then once you've got a sense of your the sort of shape you're in, uh, make a list of priorities uh, and what matters to you in thinking about wellness in this in this coming year, or if you're like me and you plan a couple weeks ahead in the next couple weeks. Um, and it's really important to remember this tip when thinking about wellness, but actually thinking about all parts of our lives, you don't have to get an A in everything. As academics, especially, we're used to being top students, uh, but you don't have to do something every day. You don't have to be, um, like now I, now, uh, you know, I meditate every single day for 20 minutes. That, that doesn't have to be you, right? Um, so making a list of priorities and thinking about what will be helpful um, for you personally is really important. And when doing this, it's important to consider the whole self, right, in a, in a sort of a holistic way. Um, and this isn't about adding a bunch of new stuff to your calendar, right, because a lot of us have very extensive calendars already. It's just about figuring, like really taking some time to reflect on what feels good and less good uh, in sort of in your body right now. Once you've got the list of priorities, it's time to set goals and think about what your top priorities are. So for me, my top priority just happens to be exercise because um, of how important it is to keep my body um, mobile in the ways I want it to be. So if that's my top priority, right, yours might be uh, I about nourishment, right, about how um, to bring new foods into your diet or to cook more or something like that. Um, make a list of those priorities and, and sort of figure out where you want to spend your time in, in sort of taking care of, of your body right now. And then get out your calendar. I think it's important to actually put in time in your calendar to do these kinds of wellness activities or to take care of yourself um, in ways that are helpful. And then finally, uh, it can be really helpful to tell people what you're up to, sort of what, uh, what your new priorities are, uh, 
or if there's something that you want to incorporate into your life, because you can build a support team that understands why this matters to you, right? And, and you can also often find people who share your priorities who might want to join in, and that's um, always fun. Uh, my um, work wife and I, for example, um, uh, we work out together. That's been a really nice way to, to sort of to connect. Uh, so finding a group of people who support you can be really, really uh, good. And then the next key, and this is part of why sometimes wellness activities uh, uh, can seem intimidating, is how do you make time and space um, for all of this? So the first thing I think that we can do is uh, to track our time, to track your time and see what uh, what you're spending so much time on. So for example, one thing that I that's on my priority list other than exercise is daily reading. Uh, I feel better when I'm reading regularly, when I'm reading fiction in particular, it helps me um, stay calm and keep perspective and it's entertaining and it feeds me, but I don't have time to read. If I actually sit and track my time and I look at all the time I spend, for example, staring at my phone for the next cat picture to show up on Facebook, right? I can see that that's time I could spend in another way. Now, there's nothing wrong with me spending time on Facebook looking at my phone. I think that's that's important to remember that that boredom and zoning out are parts of, I think, a holistic life. But I can find those, those times. And so for me, I want to spend 15 minutes a day that I would spend staring at my phone uh, reading. That's not that much time. I already feel better, right? So tracking your time and seeing where in the interstices you could fit something else will help um, sort of move um, move you uh, towards some of these goals. One thing that has stopped me sometimes from uh, calendaring in things like uh, formal exercise uh, is the idea that I need a certain amount of time to write or a certain amount of downtime to uh, to prepare for teaching or something. Uh, and it's been really helpful to challenge that idea, right? The idea that you're just that kind of writer who needs that much time uh, to write. If I don't write in a six hour block, I won't get any writing done, right? In other webinars, we've talked about this, like how to figure out how to write in, in a 15 minute chunk. Um, so challenge the idea that you're just the kind of person who doesn't have time for this stuff. Uh, and because we can all change our activities and behaviors. I used to smoke every day, 20 minutes a day, three minutes, a, or 20 cigarettes a day, three minutes a cigarette, right? That was a lot of time every day devoted to smoking. Uh, I was a smoker, that's just who I was, but then I wasn't anymore. You can actually change your life and, and that's okay. You can change parts of your life. Uh, so once you've done this, you can start to figure out where you can squeeze minutes to do other things. Um, and when you're doing this, though, one of the dangers of the calendar is it can suck you into, okay, now I have to fill every minute, right? That spare minute there, I need to spend it, you know, I'll do jumping jacks at my desk or something like that. And that's not, uh, that just makes wellness another job that you have. And I think it's important for it not to become that. So uh, it's helpful to think about wellness as about life right? And not about productivity, not about making yourself a different kind of person. Um, so I write on this slide, resist the urge to make wellness another task you'll fail at, right? Because we don't need more of those. Um, but also um, don't, I think it's helpful to not make it about being a better person or being better at something, right? That, that the kind of because my like internet algorithms right now are all about buy this calendar to maximize your productivity and what are the, the morning routines of the most successful. And that stuff is, I think, about making us better workers uh, who are more productive. And that's not necessarily uh, a goal any of us should be aiming for. So think about wellness as about living a full life rather than about how to make myself more productive, right? Like I'll, um, exercise so that I have more energy so that I can work later, like not doing that kind of stuff. Uh, wellness is, um, is a lifetime thing. It's like something that we work on all the time. It's not a, did you go to the gym today kind of thing, right? So it's not about now I meditate every day. It's about 
do I have the tools in my life to help me feel balanced and cared for when I need them? So it's helpful to be really flexible with your goals and priorities, especially because those things um, can change and change quickly. Right? So right now, maybe your priority is um, mindfulness because the anxiety is getting overwhelming, right? So maybe that's the priority. But once that anxiety tamps down, maybe it's something else, right? We're, we need to sort of stay alive to what we need uh, to stay alive. So I'm going to talk about a few different things. And, and nothing I'm about to say uh, will be new. Uh, but I think it's a good reminder and a time to reflect on these areas of, of sort of taking care of our bodies uh, that I think are important. So first I want to talk about um, exercise. So exercise uh, is, I think, especially at the new year, at least my gym is overrun with new people, which is awesome. I love seeing new people at the gym. Uh, but it's often about weight loss. And that's a really dangerous way to think about exercise because it's sort of doomed to fail. Uh, weight loss is it's tricky territory. It's very, very challenging to lose weight and keep it off. Diet culture is very damaging, um, especially I think um, to women, but to all of us of all genders, it's really damaging. So I think it's best not to think of exercise as a way of making your body look different. But what um, exercise is great for in terms of wellness is mental health and stress reduction, just getting some of that energy out. Uh, it's also good for physical health, uh, you know, for keeping your heart strong, um, you know, and for uh, for a lot of us, it can be really helpful for um, other uh, health issues. For me anyway, and I know for a lot of us, it's very helpful with sleep. If we worked out some of our energy, we'll often sleep better and uh, getting enough sleep is really hard to do. I'm an insomniac. It's really great. Uh, exercise has really helped me sleep more. And then finally, I, I think exercise is important as a way of engaging with the outside world, uh, going on walks, going on bicycle rides, um, being sort of out in the world, going on hikes, these kinds of physical activity get us sort of out of and looking up and, and sort of taking in the world around us uh, in, I think, really important ways. So. Um, Exercise uh, is about a lot of things that are related to wellness, not necessarily about losing weight. Uh, it's just so important to resist the body shaming narratives around exercise, the idea that uh, we have to become smaller. And the new year makes that, that message even harder to um, escape. I wrote on here, this part's hard, partly because uh, I don't think any of us can uh, keep it from seeping in a little bit. And, uh, and so be kind to the part of yourself that feels that sort of sneaking in. Um, when choosing what kind of exercise to do, it's really, I think, uh, my best advice is to choose to do things that you actually enjoy doing. So, for example, I really don't like using um, the recumbent bicycle at the gym. Um, I've used it sometimes when I've had injuries or been able, unable to do other things, but I like to ride my bike outside. So you know what I don't do? I don't do the recumbent bike. I ride my bike outside. Um, maybe it's dancing that you like to do. Find somewhere to go dancing. Sign up for dance lessons. Right? Find something you actually enjoy. I love riding my bike. Um, and sometimes going to um, a gym or taking gym classes can be really fun too. Uh, and it's worth a lot of gyms will have like a free class or a free pass for a week. Take advantage of those, go try things and see what you enjoy doing. Uh, and, and sometimes stuff will be really hard and maybe it's not pleasurable. And if it's not pleasurable, you're not going to stick with it. Um, so as I say here, do you want to be the kind of person who's good at burpees? Maybe not. Um, maybe you want to be the, maybe you do, but if you don't, then you don't need to be doing a zillion burpees, right? So if what you want to do is engage in with nature in a meaningful way, maybe um, putting on your calendar one hike a month would 
do something that, that most of us could fit into our schedule and would feel really good. Uh, also, when we're thinking about wellness, um, I run here, consider functional fitness. And what I mean by that is uh, fitness activities that help us do things like get up and sit back down, um, pull ourselves up from positions, um, turn, carry uh, our backpack, you know, things that actually help us use our bodies in ways that we might use them every day, uh, I think is a great way of thinking about exercise and sort of making yourself stronger so that your body can keep doing things you want it to do for as long as possible. Um, how much to exercise and, and when and, and what kind of heart rate you should get or how many steps a day, that stuff, those are stuff, that stuff, it's all metrics that if it's interesting to you, go ahead and engage it. But if it's not, don't. You can actually trust your body uh, and listen to it and, and give it what it needs. Some of us need, um, you know, some of us need to go swimming, some of us don't, right? So listen to what your body needs rather than these external sort of biopower um, metrics around maximization, right? Because that just falls into the part of wellness that turns it into yet another job. I want to talk about food. Food is, uh, talking about food should not be the, strictly the domain of, of uh, diet culture, right? It should also, you know, be something that we can think about it as, as wellness, as nourishment, as nourishing our bodies in ways that feel good to us. Um, so a lot of people will make, um, uh, like a lot of us will to make a news resolution, say to cook more or to bring our lunch. And often it's a financial decision uh, and cooking definitely will help save money, but um, it doesn't, that doesn't have to be your sort of wellness goal with food. Uh, I have found it helpful to, to sort of read about this, this sort of theory of intuitive eating, of learning to listen to our bodies, what our bodies need, when they're hungry, what will feed it, um, and using that as sort of a way of sort of re-engaging a relationship with our bodies that has been broken for a lot of us by disordered eating and by um, uh, diet culture, sort of breaking that. So when we're thinking about food, just a couple of um, questions. Do you enjoy cooking? Uh, it can be something you enjoy. If you hate it, learning, um, uh, talking about how to make yourself cook more isn't probably going to do a whole lot of good. But if you don't enjoy it, ask yourself why you don't. Is it because it feels like it takes too much time? Uh, you don't like the mess it makes? What's the reason? And, and is there a way to um, make it take less time or to cook more with um, other people so that the mess is shared. Right? So think about what you do and don't enjoy about cooking. Um, and now I'll just talk about a few um, sort of general tips for uh, think for sort of changing our thinking around food and sort of some practices that can help us uh, eat in ways that feel better than, um, than at least my eating felt when I was uh, on vacation uh, this winter. Uh, and again, none of this will be new, but it's a good reminder. So meal planning is worth it, even if it's just a day or two ahead. Having a sense of what you're going to make and having those groceries on hand just will make your life easier. A lot of us do this on Sundays because then we're set up a little bit for the week. But having a plan will make that problem of it takes too much time will make that problem smaller. Another thing that uh, makes that problem smaller is to pick easy recipes with few ingredients. Uh, there are 12 bajillion recipe websites, uh, places where you can uh, learn how to cook something very complicated. But even just Googling like easy vegetarian dinners, which I did this Sunday, will pull up a bunch of um, ideas for things that you can cook in um, under an hour. And uh, having sort of some go-to recipes can really help here as well. Uh, also, plan snacks. Uh, hungry is a terrible way to feel. Uh, and having um, planning snacks means having food around that you can eat when you're hungry because that's when you should eat. Uh, hand fruit, 
big Newtons, um, nuts, chips, whatever it is, like having, um, having food available, I think is helpful. Um, again, resist the siren song of diet talk and consider intuitive eating, thinking, um, trying to really listen to your body and what it needs and feeding it that. Remember that food is fuel. Um, and notice when and what you eat makes you feel different ways. So if I, I used to um, drink orange juice for breakfast and I noticed that my stomach was always upset about a half an hour after that, but I was still drinking orange juice because that's a breakfast juice. Turns out that kind of acid in my stomach isn't great. Um, so now I don't. It doesn't have to be a big life change, right? But just listen to what your body needs and when it needs it. Finally, remember that food is more than just fuel. It's also social and celebratory. Uh, and I think that making space for that is also really important in overall wellness. I remember leading up to uh, the holidays, uh, there was a lot of talk at my gym, for example, about how, um, how we had to sort of survive the holidays by not eating the food of the holidays, like not having um, too much food at parties. And I thought, but I want to go to the party and enjoy myself. And that's part of the pleasure of being alive. I don't want, I don't want to go there and be in a kind of thought process of denial, right? I want to go socialize, see my friends um, and people I love and, and food is a part of that. And so making room for that, I think is really important to overall wellness as well. The last area of wellness I wanted to talk about was mindfulness. And I know it's such a buzzword. And when like Microsoft is paying for all of its employees to, you know, and Apple for all of its employees to do like mindfulness retreats at the corporate headquarters can make us very suspicious. Um, but I will say that mindfulness practices can be really helpful for overall wellness. Um, and even just uh, taking 10 minutes a day to sit quietly can be really, uh, really, really helpful. So um, for a lot of us, wellness, uh, mindfulness practices help us reduce resistance um, to thought and open space for feeling better about ourselves. So what, a lot of what mindfulness, mindfulness training isn't about learning how to not worry or learning how to not think, but learning how to not fixate on those worries or thoughts and let them overtake us, right? So it's sort of about um, practice of not resisting thought, but letting it move through us and not overtake us. So the practice can be very helpful for people with anxiety or people who worry a lot, um, which is a lot of um, academics. And uh, it can be, mindfulness can be really helpful in this area. So um, there are lots of apps for um, mindfulness um, books um, that are available. A couple that I wanted to mention here, um, Headspace has an, um, an app. It's probably the most well-known and I have a zillion different programs that are geared toward the sort of problem that, that you're working on. So for example, they have one about cancer and they have one about um, insomnia, uh, fatigue, uh, focus at work. They, they even have mindfulness programs that um, can help you with exercise. So um, Headspace is a really, um, great app for learning some basic techniques and also getting some guidance in particular areas. It does cost money. Um, so that can uh, be a turnoff. And also I think for a lot of us spending, um, you know, sort of feeding a corporate wellness industry can feel not um, amazing. So uh, that's a caveat about that one. Another uh, app that you, that's available for phones is called Stop, Breathe, Think. And it's one of the most popular and it just has um, these different guided meditations to just sort of take a few minutes out of your day um, and sit. Um, Insight Timer is another one and that one is free. So uh, that might be a good place to start. Uh, but in terms of taking time from the anxiety of the everyday and just learning to sort of center oneself, uh, mindfulness practices can be invaluable. Um, and it doesn't have to be meditation or an app. Just finding something that gives you some quiet time and space is super important to wellness, even if it's just for five minutes a day. But just finding somewhere where you can just <sighs> exhale um, and be with yourself in, in a sort of a calm way 
is um, really important. So um, as we're sort of coming to the end of this webinar, um, I want to talk about the importance of thinking holistically about ourselves, about our bodies as as part of, as not uh, separate from our minds, right? Our bodies are not just <clears throat> flesh sacks that move our heads around. Um, uh, but that's sort of how we're taught to think about them. So um, as I write here, thinking holistically about ourselves goes against almost everything we are taught. And, um, and that's, so when we're thinking about wellness in a more holistic way, be patient with the ways that it doesn't feel good, right? Or it doesn't, um, or we sort of start veering off into like, oh great, now I have another job and it's to go to this like jazzercise class every Wednesday and now I'm failing, right? It's, it's natural to sort of go those places. So be patient as you're sort of making new practices um, for wellness. Um, also important is think critically about what self-care means for you. So we talked today about food, exercise, and mindfulness. Those are three areas of wellness and self-care but they might not be areas that are important for you. Maybe for you, self-care um, is about uh, a regular massage, or maybe self-care is what makes you feel well and whole is to pay all your bills on time, right? So maybe that's your goal. So thinking critically about what's, what will help you feel well is, um, is uh, vital. Uh, also know that balance, and, and you already know this, but I'll repeat it know that balance is fleeting and temporary. Uh, it's not a state that, that's ever achieved, right? So what wellness, I think, um, the way that we're thinking about it, wellness is um, about practices of the self that, uh, that tend to the needs of the body and that listen to the body and uh, respond to its needs in ways that, that nourish it, right? But this isn't something that you're just like, oh, now I'm in balance because um, I, you know, I exercise and I eat right. Um, the balance is much more complicated than that. And then finally, talking about wellness, I um, also did want to talk about sort of medicalized wellness, which uh, is not the same thing as wellness. But don't forget, if you have health insurance, um, uh, don't forget those doctor's appointments, screening tests, dentist appointments, those ways of tending to the, um, the, those sort of physiological needs of the body, super duper important. Um, so, so sort of being attentive, you know, or attending to the body, uh, and reaching out to professionals when needed is, uh, also a part of wellness. So we do have some um, other resources at Ideas on Fire that you might find helpful if you're interested in talking about wellness. Uh, and you'll get a copy of this um, PowerPoint in your email. And these are hyperlinks. But um, we've got a, um, a post about self-care resources for interdisciplinary scholars. Uh, we've also got a post about self-care practices belong re beyond relaxation. So these are self-care practices that are more um, not so much about relaxing your body or mind, but about taking care of uh, some of the logistics of life. Uh, I also thought that you might find interesting our section on using passion projects for inspiration, self-care, and fun, because uh fun and joy are really important parts of wellness. And this post gives some great ideas about um, sort of finding passion in our work and using that to, um, to sort of feel good. Uh, and then finally, we have um, a, a post about some uh, 10 self-care tips for the end of the semester. And it might not be the end of the semester, but for those stressful times ramping up a semester, those middle times that are challenging in the semester. Self-care, these self-care tips, I think, will come in uh, very handy. Uh, we have a webinar every month. So if you have not yet joined our newsletter, please do. And uh, you'll get notifications of upcoming webinars. All right, so I'm going to exit this. And I will come back to our power. Come back here. Um, hello, I'm back. 
Oh, so I'm sorry. I'm so sorry you couldn't see the slides. I'm hoping that um, is anyone still here to see if they could see the the slides? All right, well, hopefully, um, if uh, uh, if the sort of screen share didn't work, I will make sure that uh, when we send out the link to this webinar, uh, that it includes the slides. So you'll be able to go through them then. All right, well, um, thank you for joining us today here at Ideas on Fire. And uh, let's all take care of ourselves and engage, um, engage the wellness practices that make us feel well. Right, bye.